So is the Murray who's on this committee one of the areas? Good day. Oh, thumbs down on that one then. Good evening and welcome to the Scarborough Board of Education meeting. Tonight is Thursday, August 14th, 2014. Um, can we please have the attendance? Uh, Mrs. Vealy? Here. Mr. Chiazzo? Here. Mrs. Lang? Here. Mrs. Massengill? Mrs. Murphy? Here. Mrs. Perry? Mrs. Mm -hmm. Jay? Here. Ms. Murray? Here. Could please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I know we do have some adjustments to the agenda. Um, the adjustments to the agenda, I believe, have been sent out in, a de in an addendum and uh, relate to um, some additional appointments that um, as we get ready to start the, the school year, and it's um, 7.2, so um, 0.3, 0.4, 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, have been added. And so that's the adjustment. Okay, thank you. And I'll, I'll go through each of those. Okay. Thank you. And then superintendent's report. Um, <clears throat> as I said, uh, the start of school is right around the corner. Um, the the uh, department stores are happy to hear that. The kids are not so happy. Uh, but we continue to gear up um, in every way imaginable to be ready for another great year of teaching and learning here um, in the Scarborough schools. Uh, the Leadership Council had a very, very productive summer work session yesterday. Um, some of the highlights of uh, the work that was done uh, include, um, we did a warm-up activity where we uh, reflected on the accomplishments of last school year and um, at the same, same time decided to include those in our um, submission for uh, the annual report. So it was two birds with one stone, feeling good, reflecting on the uh, successes and as well capturing uh, what will be included in the annual report to the town. Uh, it was also important that we revisit again the 18-month improvement plan as we do plan to extend it to 24 months uh, to give us um, that uh, extra six months. The trajectory of progress has been very strong and good. Um, but I think that we had anticipated uh, that we would have been um, moving quicker, perhaps, in some um, areas in terms of securing resources uh, that um, had previously been lost um, in, uh, in years before. So um, it was important that each of the phases, each, of each uh, department and the district uh, reflect on that 18-month improvement plan, see what has been accomplished. The good news is that much of it has been accomplished and to also look at what would be extended um, to uh, the, the spring of this coming year uh, when we would plan to host another community dialogue. Uh, that was a very valuable um, and very, um, a very focused uh, um, effort and exercise on the part of the Leadership Council. They did a very good job with that. We got a report out on uh, proficiency-based diplomas and uh, there will be a, an update as well provided to the board um, as, the, as the state has provided opportunities for extension um, on the legislative deadlines related to um, proficiency-based diplomas. And um, aren't we thankful um, that we can uh, do that? Um, and there'll be more on that coming. Um, we did refresh the Leadership Council's communication plan for this upcoming year. Um, there will be schoolhouse news editions uh, printed. Uh, so that's happening. Calendar coordination is critically important, uh, particularly as we try to fit in some important pieces that will support the performance evaluation and professional growth uh, system that will be um, piloted this year. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we have um, dissected the art and science of teaching, which is Marzano's research and which serves as the foundation for that system of professional evaluation and uh, of um, uh, performance evaluation and professional growth. And we are, um, we had to schedule in to each of the schools um, 
an opportunity for six modules to be offered throughout the, the school year that will uh, serve to um, better uh, engage and make more familiar um, all of the teaching staff with the Marzano model. We charted uh, PLTs. Uh, as you know, the Leadership Council also has PLTs, um, and we charted PLTs for the upcoming year. Um, one of those will focus and continue to focus on the uh, performance evaluation uh, professional growth system, and the other will um, look deeper into best practices for student-centered learning. Um, and so uh, folks are pretty excited about that. Um, it's about split half and half in terms of the leadership uh, council, and we've got good, strong teams um, working in each of those PLT areas. Uh, so that gives you a, a sense of what was accomplished. I'm always, um, always pleased to see um, the, uh, the way that uh, the leadership council takes on uh, this work. Um, they uh, get things done very efficiently. Um, and very, very, very thoughtfully. Uh, let's see. Um, speaking of the Marzano Performance Evaluation and Professional Growth System, members of the Leadership Council, members of the um, teacher team for the, the new evaluation system, and instructional coaches, along with Mrs. Bealey as your school board rep, um, attended some important foundation training that also happened this week. Uh, the first day focused on domain one, which is all of the essential elements to good or high quality teaching and learning. And the second day focused on Marzano's um, eye observation, which is the web-based tool that supports the whole system. And it's, um, I think people walked away uh, feeling good about the session. I think we had a good trainer, and um, the, uh, uh, the technological efficiency that's offered by eye observation and the incredible professional learning resources that it has um, are, are very, very impressive. So I think uh, people are excited um, about uh, getting that pilot up and running, and then we will put that into full gear uh, the following year. Uh, both days were uh, executed well by the trainer, um, and uh, uh, she received uh, high ratings from the participants. And I don't know if Mrs. Bealey or Mrs. Sizemore have comments. They were both present. So this is a huge piece of work. Uh, it's the result of the fact that uh, every school system in the state of Maine has to comply with a new law that goes into effect a year from now throughout the state and that is that each town has to come up with its new uh, way to evaluate, observe and evaluate its staff members, uh, both administrators and educa all educators. So um, it's a huge piece of work, and fortunately um, we were able to uh, take a hold of the model which is uh, under one of the big gurus in education right now, which is Marzano. And so we're able to, um, you know, kind of educate our teachers about this model and basically have a framework on which we can um, do our observations and evaluations. And also a huge component is the professional development of teachers. Uh, that is a really big piece of this um, project. and. Basically, people in this district have done a tremendous amount of work to prepare a document to submit to the state this fall uh, that hopefully will be so comprehensive that it'll pass. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> and not have to be changed <laughs> and resubmitted um, because the hours of work that have gone into this unpaid time by teachers working summers, vacations, after school till 5, 5.30 at night. People who have come forward um, and just done a wonderful, wonderful job of, of getting on board with this. And so now it will allow us to bring on board the entire uh, district under a whole new professional model that will allow them to show growth. And hopefully uh, this will also increase growth for students throughout the district. Okay. Um, let's see. 
Uh, in terms of facility readiness for the start of school, uh, finishing touches are um, happening at the Wentworth. Uh, they're progressing as expected, and, um, and uh, we will be ready to fully welcome our Wentworth students in for their very first day, um, which for them will happen um, after Labor Day. Um, that is not the same for all students. That's for our 3-5 uh, students. Um, as for the rest of the school facilities, Todd Jepson, our facilities director, reports that um, work is ongoing and now can be accelerated now that the summer programs are done. Uh, basically, now that we can uh, get the, the, uh, the buildings uh, to be empty so that no one's walking on newly uh, waxed floors, et cetera. Uh, so we're confident that we'll be welcoming back staff and our students to a very clean, safe, and orderly environment in every one of our schools. And again, Mrs. Sizemore may wish to comment more on Wentworth. Uh, Wentworth is really coming along. The art installation was completed this week. It looks fabulous. Um, the building is um, will be ready uh, August 26th for the teachers. The teachers can come in on August 25th, but school starts for teachers on August 26th. Um, the classrooms are uh, a good size and will have a wonderful learning opportunities for the students. Uh, it, for teachers, I think it's an, uh, it's an unbelievable experience in their career to be able to create a new school, and not just the building, but I mean to create the learning environment, the technology that's there, um, really is uh, <coughs> wonderful for kids and for students in their profession, for professional growth for the teachers and uh, learning opportunities for the students. There's STEM labs on each wing which uh, give the teachers and students an opportunity to do experiments, to try things. Um, so I'm really anxious to see how it all comes together um, throughout the year. Uh, Kelly Crosby and John Thurlow have done a fabulous job in trying to get it up and running and, and uh, working without an office for a long time, but we're getting there. The office staff has started to put things together, and so I know that we will be ready. Thank you. Um, just a, um, a last piece of business has to do with the Friends of Scarborough Hockey Incorporated. Uh, we've included in your packet an introductory letter uh, that came from the group, um, an executive summary to give you a sense of the project and the, um, the proposal that is um, being considered um, and the members of the, uh, of the group's um, board and some uh, background information on them. Uh, this is not being brought to the board uh, for any action. Uh, it's really uh, for your information and this is an opportunity as we have um, Mr. Bradish and uh, Mr. Murray here uh, tonight to answer any questions that school board members may have related to this project. Um, and I would just make note that Mr. Legage, who is also here, um, and Mr. Creech have had, have had some opportunity to give some, some input and I know that that was appreciated uh, by the group. Uh, they uh, likely uh, will have more imp input as um, we go forward. This is not a school project, um, but as you uh, know from reading the materials or as you'll hear from these gentlemen, um, it uh, is uh, proposed to be on the, the school campus. So um, it does uh, involve us uh, essentially as, as, as neighbors, if you will. So um, uh, you may wish to open uh, uh, to the board uh, to see if they have any questions of the gentleman here. Does anybody have any questions for the gentleman who are here? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, <laughs> step up. In order to pick up your voice, podium. you'll need to yep. be up at the podium. And maybe could you, um, for the, the, we happen to have some audience members tonight and members of the public who didn't have this um, letter in front of them, just a brief synopsis of what, um, what you're doing. Um, so uh, what we're doing is looking to put another sheet of ice, um, a um, in, indoor ice arena, uh, in the southern main area. Uh, we've targeted uh, obviously Scarborough because the uh, majority of the board members are from uh, the Scarborough area. Um, we've put together a business plan. This all basically came about following a meeting with Michael Gage back in May um, when an unfortunate incident occurred where we lost some very good ice time that was available to us at MHG. Um, Mike uh, informed both Jeff and myself. Jeff is the president of the girls' hockey boosters. I'm the president of the boys' hockey boosters. Informed us that the uh, primetime ice at MHG was gone, 
and that he was working diligently to find us any ice that was available in the area. Unfortunately, a lot of that ice was um, not prime time, uh, 5.30 a.m. in many cases. Um, and so that was a great, what I call, corrective action. Um, my background is project management, and I'm a big, firm believer in preventative action. Uh, so from a preventative action standpoint, we thought um, looking into building an ice rink in the general area uh, would be beneficial. So since that time, we've been working towards achieving that goal. Thank you. Jackie? Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me, please. First of all, I want to say thank you for taking on this project because after you do the ice arena, a pool would be appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, where would you want to locate that? Which piece of land in this town that the town owns are you looking at? So originally we looked at several pieces of property, um, but in recent meetings with um, Tom Hall, um, and a, a piece of property was identified on the Scarborough campus, um, which is basically right behind the the mobile gas station, um, paralleling uh, 114. So basically where the, I believe it's identified as the teacher's parking lot. Um, that is what's being considered at this time. Um, we realized that the parking lot, uh, parking spots will be displaced. And so the idea is that where the old water tower was, uh, we'll be responsible um, to build a alternative parking area to subsidize those uh, parking spots that were lost. Excuse me. It, uh, have you started or do you yet have commitments from people for fundraising? So, no. The short answer is no. Um, we have a business plan that identifies the funds that will be needed to raise this. We have a fundraising president, uh, Jeff Murray, uh, and we've identified key um, areas that we'll be addressing to uh, raise these funds. Um, unfortunately, one of the things that was required that we're working on, which is a 501c3 status, a non-for-profit, and many of the larger donors that we're directing um, must have that in writing first. Um, I was on the phone with the IRS this week, and they've assured me that it is progressing, uh, and we should hopefully be us, uh, receiving that in the coming weeks. Weeks? Weeks. It took Kiwanis about five months, but that's okay. <laughs> right. Well, we, we submitted this back in May. Okay, so this has been an ongoing process. And lastly, do you have commitments from adjacent towns? You said that Cape Elizabeth and South Portland were interested in, in uh, renting the facility on an ongoing basis. Do you have commitments from people there to help with the fundraising? We, uh, when we got uh, started with the process, well, over a year ago now, we had some initial meetings with people from Cape Elizabeth and South Portland about the opportunities for using the ice as well as working with us to raise the funds for the ice. So uh, what we have coming up here in the course of the next couple of weeks is meetings with both those booster organizations um, to engage in that very uh, specific process. So it ultimately, while this rink will happen hopefully here, um, this will be an effort that will encompass Scarborough, South Portland, and Cape Elizabeth. Thank you very much, and good luck. And, and this young lady twisted my arm to say I'd support it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, a couple of things. I assume this is an indoor rink? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Have you been involved in any other towns putting an indoor rink in like this that are in Maine? So a couple of things, I guess, along those lines. Both Chuck and I have been very engaged in youth hockey for uh, many, many years. I've been uh, president of the youth hockey organization out in Gorm for uh, uh, four years, um, and uh, Chuck was involved with that same organization. We've coached youth hockey for a long time. So the point of all that is that we have a lot of experience around hockey, uh, scheduling of hockey, running of rinks. We know a lot of people who run the rinks in the area. Um, when we started this process a year ago, one of the first things we did was we reached out to a couple of the rinks in the local area and spoke to them about their development process. Uh, Chuck had some very direct conversations with the people that developed the Family Ice Center in Falmouth, and mm -hmm. we spoke to them about the development process that they went through and the things they felt they did wrong, and we've, uh, we learned a lot of lessons mm -hmm. from that. And in fact, maybe some of the reasons why we are at the stage we're at today is because of the advice that we got from them about how they went about that process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, simply put, 
that was make sure we get all some of the background work done ahead of time before we go out and, well, frankly, get to this point where it becomes a, a public matter and where you really start to try uh, raising funds to, um, to bring the project to completion. So th this would be on school grounds. Okay. Yes. Um, so are there any of these other towns that you can think of that you looked into um, have, have the rink on school grounds? And what has been any of the comments you've heard for the impact on the school district? So I'm not aware of any of the towns in the local area that have rinks on their town property, or at least on the school property, I should say. Um, Falmouth being an example, that Family Ice Center happens to be the home for a few of the towns in the surrounding area. That becomes their home high school rink, uh, but of course it's not on the high school grounds, and that's true in the, in the surrounding area. Bitterford's rink, for example, is not on a school campus. Um, the rink in Gorham, while it is on a school campus, on the University of Southern Maine's campus. So Gorham High School, Bonnie Eagle, the towns like that are using that rink as their home rink, um, but there are not other rinks uh, on any of the high school grounds. May I add? Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's unique about Scarborough is Scarborough does not have a downtown, uh, and so uh, Scarborough is supporting a campus type environment, and so this falls into, that's why we've had the conversations, the campus environment where this mm -hmm. ice rink will be on the uh, high school campus. Mm -hmm. uh, so we believe that it's a very beneficial thing. So when it comes to the employment of people who will be working at this rink, that will be all within your your responsibility as a nonprofit? Yeah, so we've, uh, we've created a, a structure that would include a, a board that would operate the rink itself. On that board would be representatives from the town of Scarborough, from the school in Scarborough, as well as uh, South Portland and Cape Elizabeth and some ad hoc members. Um, and that organization would be responsible for running the rink from a profit and loss perspective and so forth. It would be run as a not-for-profit organization, of course. Um, but I think the important thing to add there is that we've very specifically identified the fact that because of the fact that we're dealing with school children, it'll be on a school campus, that we need to make sure hiring practices and so forth are in line with what the school department's um, mm -hmm. recommendations would be. So we would look to you for maybe for some guidance along those lines. While they would be the employees of the board, the, the uh, Friends of Scarborough Hockey Board, um, we would look to hire people based upon guidelines that, that you would use for hiring people in the schools. But you would be responsible for overseeing all of them and That's all correct. Of that. That's correct, yes. Um, and finally, um, what roughly, do you have a, a figure in mind of the kind of money you're looking at raising? The preliminary budget at least uh, suggests that we'd need to raise about five and a half million dollars to uh, build the rink and run it for its first year. So we tried to make a very conservative estimate of, of the monies that we needed to raise. And uh, that would include um, acquiring property, building the building itself, as well as running the rink for a year. And uh, we feel that that's an uh, appropriate budget. Okay, thank you. Oh, Joni has one as well. I just want to ask one question. Um, <laughs> and I know you're really early stages right now, but if everything goes according to your plan, when would you foresee opening? So uh, I point out, I, I, Chuck mentioned that we've kind of talked about this from May, but that was actually May of 2013. So in right. fact, we're a good uh, 14, oh, 16 okay. months into this process. Um, and, but our anticipation is that we would open this rink in, in October of 2015 um, for, that, uh, for that hockey season. Okay. This rink is intended to run maybe on a six-month operational basis, something like October to April each year. Okay. Sorry. She stole one of my questions. Um, <laughs> But my second one is, will it be open to the public? Yeah, so there's so certainly intentions uh, and designs to have this available for uh, town use at, as well as for the high school hockey. The premise, a lot of the rinks in the area run on the premise of, of youth hockey organizations. That is not the design here at all. Our intention very specifically is to have this rink available for high school and middle school programs, both boys and girls, um, of the towns that we've been talking about. But then that leaves us opportunities for a lot of other things as well. So um, uh, figure skating would be one. Um, town activities would be another. Maybe phys ed classes would be a third. So there's many different opportunities, uh, possibly even, say, youth programs for the, for the very young in town. So there's a lot of opportunities within the schedule that keeps the rink profitable but still allows us to use some of the time, the ice time that's available during the week for town activities. Because it would, it would be
be open year round. It would just primarily be. No, we would intend to. So uh, the way most rinks run is that they'll put the ice in at a certain time and then they'll take it out again at another time. And it depends on the rink and all the rinks in the area run on different schedules throughout the year. Uh, our intention would be typically to put the ice in sometime in October, take the ice out sometime in April, not use the building in from April to October, uh, but actually just have an ice surface there for about six months each year. And, and the reason for that is, as part of the business plan, we looked into the uh, financial opportunities in the summer. Right. And luckily, we worked with a lot of other uh, ice rinks, and there's one in particular, Family Ice Center, that works diligently to fill every hour in the summer, and that's his whole off-season job. Uh, and in looking at that, we'd be competing against that, and we felt there would be no, no business reason to keep it open during the summer. Right. Great. Thank you, guys. I wanted to um, repeat what Jackie said. It's great to see the enthusiasm, and it's encouraging to see people getting involved. Chris? Um, <clears throat> a couple quick questions. Uh, the, um, the property that you guys have settled on, uh, is that finalized, or have you looked at other ones? Or what, what, what are the, uh, Let's start from the beginning. What are the requirements? How much acreage are you needing, or how much square footage are you needing to develop this property? The uh, building design that we have right now is uh, 37,000 square feet, I believe it is. About one acre. So just <laughs> under an acre. And um, we did look at, at a variety of different properties around town as uh, potential opportunities. But when we got talking with Tom Hall here a uh, uh, few months ago now, um, we got talking about opportunities potentially on the campus here as a whole. And it was actually at Tom's suggestion that we considered this spot, which as Chuck pointed out, was what's considered to be the teacher's parking lot today. Um, it has a lot of benefits associated with it. Obviously, if you consider what we do for, say, busing of the students and so forth to get them to the ice practices or to their uh, practices as well as their home games, um, it's not a trivial budget item, and it's something that would certainly benefit us here in Scarborough. It's also something that helps extend the campus here uh, as well. But um, uh, ultimately, we've not finalized on that property location. Uh, we will be meeting with the town council next week, and our goal at that meeting will be to have a memor memorandum of understanding identified with the town um, that would uh, move us forward in that direction, at least. Another question I have is if, if it's going to be joint development with South Portland and Cape Elizabeth for the financing, which I think is a, is a great opportunity for sure, uh, how are you going to determine prime ice time if you've got three competing communities there and if we all have an equal share, how are you going to divvy that up? Yeah, it's funny that that conversation comes up every time we talk about the rink with anyone from any town, right? So, um, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, RAD would say the same, right? We'd like to have the primary time. But ultimately what we recognize is that if we're going to make the rink work well, that it has to be shared ice time, and there will still be some early morning ice practices. Uh, they just won't be to the extent that they were here for us uh, this past season, for example. So uh, the goal is to have a, a board of directors that will incorporate uh, somebody from each of the schools. So Scarborough, South Portland, and Cape will also have somebody <coughs> from the town um, on that board as well because they have some responsibility certainly for the property and, and that sort of thing, as well as three at-large members. And so within the process of having some stake in the game on the board of directors, uh, each of those members will have some say at least in how some of that ice time gets uh, balanced out over the course of a year. But to address the first part of your question relative to supporting fundraising, um, we are not relying on South Portland and Cape Elizabeth to participate in self, uh, fundraising. Should they engage, that would be fabulous, mm -hmm. um, but that was not the intent. Um, mm -hmm. When we first approached South Portland and Cape Elizabeth sometime last fall, um, they had talked about the fact that they had tried a similar endeavor, uh, the Tri-Town Arena in Wainwright. Somewhere at 10, 10, 10 or 12 years ago, maybe. Yeah. Years right. ago. <laughs> and um, so they were very supportive of what we were doing. Um, but again, we're not relying on them to bring forward, say, a half million dollars. Um, we have every intention of raising all the funds in our own. Okay. Thank you. I got a question. Um, since in your business plan, do you envision that $5 million all come from donations, or are you going to involve banks as a loan? Yeah, so we're, we do not intend to take a loan out to build this property. It, 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 the goal is to raise all that money in advance of building the rink so that we would not have any debt service on the building itself. Okay. Now, how about the ownership downturn, you know, when you just feel it because it sounds uh, 
public land, so uh, is the uh, ownership going to be the town or the organization, you guys? So the, uh, the intention at the moment is that the town would continue to own the land. The uh, charitable organization, Friends of Scarborough Hockey, would own the building. And uh, because we'd be working together and through some, obviously, some legal documentation that will occur over time, um, I guess we'll, we'll play out the rest of the details to that particular ownership circumstance. So for the high school or middle school hockey team use this you know, in the future, do you uh, envision us as a school district to pay for those ice hockey time, or do you think that's going to be, you know, become a benefit of the town? So. Yeah, no. The, so the ice time has a cost associated with it, and and would in this circumstances as well. Um, the benefits of the rink being here are not about the cost of the ice, for example, being uh, less or anything like that, but rather some of the peripheral things that are around that, like transportation costs, for example. The fact that, frankly, we would have a place where we could say was our home rink. Um, today, we don't have that circumstance, uh, right? The the girls won the state championship last year, and they have no place to actually hang a banner, right? I mean, they don't have a home rink that they can identify and put something that way. The boys' teams had great success over the last few years, and, and the same thing would go there. So we'd like to think that some of the benefits of this rink aren't about, say, the cost of ice time, for example, but about the fact that it creates an entity for the school, just like we have the very nice football or soccer field, um, baseball fields, things, you know, gymnasium for the basketball team, things of that nature help create community. And, uh, and with that, then uh, we get some other benefits like you know, reduced bus costs and things of that nature. And the, and the intent was not to put any burden on the town of Scarborough, right? And so in order to do that, the business plan requires that we sell the ice. Right, and so in order for us to be a, um, a not a drain on the community, we've got to continue uh, to be a successful organization and sell a majority of the ice time. Thank you very much. And, and the biggest benefit is one the, the adjacent to school property, so students can walk to the rink. Uh, we have a, an opportunity to save the cost of bus transportation, which is. Uh, Mr. Legage, is that in the vicinity of ten, twenty thousand dollars a year for transportation? And thirdly, there will be locker rooms for our students to leave their equipment. Uh, I see them hauling these big bags out of the bus and into their cars, and that that will be available to our students as well. That's correct. Absolutely. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> we need a full <laughs> I don't even have any children. Well, thank you very much for sharing the details of your project. It's very exciting for all of us, and hopefully we'll see you soon with an update saying look, all, all systems go. So good luck. Thanks for the time. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, next item is the chair's report. Um, I'm sort of a fraud as the vice chair tonight, but I'll give a vice chair's report. Um, school is starting soon and not everyone has the same school start date, so please be sure to check our website and um, identify when your particular student or students start, and it may not be the same day for all the students in your home, which causes a little bit of friction, frankly, when you have three, <laughs> but um, it's the way it goes. Uh, also, before school starts, we also have the very fun summer fest tomorrow night coming up and there are a lot of charitable organizations in town that will be there trying to raise some money um, including uh, Town and Country Credit Union. We'll be having a dunk tank that benefits Project Grace and yours truly will be in the tank <laughs> from 4.30 to 5 tomorrow. So I'm you'll have to wait in a long <laughs> line behind my kids but they, um, they promised me there is a ladder to get back to the seat. So good for that. So <laughs> I will not drown. There will be a way to get back Sorry, up. I'm going to miss that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to be special, I'm sure. Um, I would say that that's it. Just be aware of the new traffic pattern around the schools because that median strip is set up and there will be handicap parking at Wentworth only. So you'll need to, if you're coming from Oak Hill, turn around at the library and come back up to park there. Otherwise, everyone at the high school. May I ask a question of the superintendent with regards to his report? Uh, my question is, how close are we 
on the proficiency-based diploma. How close are we in Scarborough? How much time do you have, Ms. Perry, for oh. me to <laughs> explain where we are? Um, it depends on, I think, I think we are making excellent progress towards high quality instruction happening here in Scarborough um, and continuing to improve that quality. That's an essential element to anything that's proficiency based. The state's view of proficiency based is the window dressing around diplomas. Um, we are not going to necessarily fall prey to that thinking because we know that changes in quality education programs takes time and we're doing all of the right things including the Mars in implementation of the Marzano system that yes is mandated by the state but yes it's actually the perfect thing to be doing right now here in Scarborough to continue to build on the momentum of improving instruction. So I would say that we are well on our way to having a solid foundation to move towards a proficiency-based diploma. Um, those things don't happen overnight. The extensions will actually um, uh, push out the legislative deadline to um, 2020. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. May I say two more things? Sure. Uh, at Summerfest, uh, the Kiwanis Club is going to have little buckets out to collect money for the Scarborough Food Pantry. So if you see a colored bucket and you just have some change or a dollar to, to drop in, remember there are about 200 families in our town who use the Scarborough Food Pantry on a monthly basis. And lastly, I just had an email from Project Grace that at last count they needed 12 more backpacks for children. Uh, it's not very expensive, folks. My sister and I did three backpacks for children and we spent $100, including the backpacks and the necessary items. So go to the Project Grace table tomorrow night and either give them some school supplies get a list of what's needed, or please give them some money because this is for children who don't have enough supplies to start school. Thank you. And what is the proceeds from the dunk tank are going for the um, Project Grace's back to school efforts. So. What, is, what is the Project Grace website that people can go to? It's um, pgme.org. Thank you very much. Okay. So moving on to new business, 7.1, minutes of July 31st meeting. Move approval is printed. Second. Are there any adjustments anyone needs to make? Can you even excuse me if that one's here? Okay. Okay. All in favor of approving the minutes from July 31st? Okay. I didn't even count one, two, three, four, five, six. Six. Plus five. five plus one, right. Mm -hmm. No, Christine. Okay. Thank you. And then on to 7.2, appointments. Yes, appointments are 7.2. And seven, item 7.2.1 is interim K2 assistant principal. And Cass has been identified as interim assistant principal to work with Kelly Mullen Martin, who will serve as principal of both Pleasant Hill and Blue Point schools for the 2014 2015 school year. This interim appointment is to support, this interim appointment of uh, Mrs. Cass is to support K2 during the transition leadership year at Wentworth School. Mrs. Cass holds a BA in English from Colby College and an MA in English from Middlebury College. She has extensive teaching experience, has served as principal and head of schools in both public and private schools. Mrs. Cass has been employed within the Scarborough schools as a substitute and long-term substitute teacher and was acting principal at Blue Point during Mr. Uh, Thurlow's medical absence, which um, was at the beginning of, or actually the first half of, of last school year. And the administrative recommendation is to endorse the appointment of Ann Cass as the interim assistant principal at K2. We're very fortunate, very excited to 
um, welcome Anne back to that leadership team, and she so happens to be here tonight with her spouse. Mm -hmm. um, so would you stand, Anne, and be recognized as, th there's Anne Cass. <laughs> um, Thank you. And, um, and if anyone questions about that BA or MA in English, just engage in a little debate with her and you'll quickly find that she's quite skilled. Um, so yes, we are delighted uh, to have Anne there. So that's the recommendation. Move approval. Second. Second. Okay, all in favor of Anne Cass, Assistant Interim Principal of K2s. Okay, six. Thank you. And again, we are Welcome very, back. we're so happy to have Anne uh, back working with us. She spent all day yesterday with us, um, and it's like she has just always been there. It's uh, terrific. Um, items, I'm going to move on now, Anne. Um, <laughs> 7.2.2 2 is middle school special ed teacher. This is Rachel Powers nominated to fill this position. It's due to her retirement. Ms. Powers received her Bachelor of Science in Secondary Education from University of Scranton uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, and her MA in Deaf Education from Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C. She's been an English teacher, reading teacher, teacher of the deaf in Washington, D.C., and most recently at the Governor Baxter School for the Deaf. She will, um, the um, administrative recommendation is to appoint Rachel Powers as middle school special education teacher. Move approval. Second. Okay, all in favor of Rachel Powers, middle school special ed teacher. Six, thank you. Um, item 7.2.3, uh, Wentworth School Classroom Teacher. Uh, this is Gail Labonte, um, nominated to fill a position that's created by realignment. Ms. Labonte received her Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from University of Maine. Her Master's in Business from Husson College received her Master's of Science in Education from UNE. Um, and she has a number of degrees there. She has been a grade four teacher at Walton Elementary School in, in um, Auburn since 2011. Basically had a, a very productive career in business and decided that teaching was really her passion. Um, the recommendation is to appoint Gail Labonte as Wentworth School Classroom Teacher. Move approval. Second. Second. Okay. Chris. Um, I'm wondering, Dr. Anderson, if you could, for the benefit of everybody, um, define what it means by realignment, what that, how that position was created. Um, so, so the uh, the technology integrated position created the the vacancy. Okay, thank you. The opportunity. Thank you. And she and uh, I told um, Ms. Labonte that she has big shoes to fill, but I am confident that she will do that. Okay. All in favor of Gail Labonte, Wentworth School Classroom Teacher? Six. Thank you. Item 7.2.4, Wentworth School Classroom Teacher. Michelle McPherson is nominated to fill this position that's created by a retirement. Ms. McPherson received her undergraduate degree from the University of Maine at Farmington, graduate degree from UNE. She's been teaching in elementary schools in um, Poland, Maine, and Buxton, Maine. Uh, for nine years, we're delighted uh, to uh, make the recommendation for the appointment of Michelle McPherson as Wentworth School Classroom Teacher. Move approval. Second. Okay. All in favor of Ms. McPherson, Wentworth School Classroom Teacher? Six. Thank you. Um, item 7.2.5 at Wentworth School Classroom Teacher. This is just a one-year position, and I know you were impressed with my Spanish last time. Uh, this is not Spanish, but it is Cheeli uh, Zinchuk is nominated to fill this one-year position created by a one-year leave of absence. Ms. Zinchuk uh, received her bachelor's degree in sociology from the University of Southern Maine, master's degree in elementary ed from Marymount University in Virginia. She's been uh, student teaching, substitute teaching, and in Ed Tech 3 in both Maine and Virginia. The recommendation is to appoint to Ellie Zinchuk as a one-year Wentworth School classroom teacher. Move approval. Second. All in favor of Shaili uh, Zinchuk as a one-year Wentworth teacher. Thank you. Item 7.2.6, this is a part-time school nurse. Nancy Ray is nominated to fill this new position on a part-time ba basis. It was, uh, it was um, uh, brought forth as a part-time position, and that's what she's filling it as. Mrs. Ray received her nursing degree from Northeastern University. She's been a practicing nurse 
in many different capacities, including a pediatric nurse for over nine years. The recommendation is to appoint Nancy Ray as a part-time school nurse, an excellent addition to the, um, to the nursing um, and, and medical staff. Move approval. Second. All in favor of approving Nancy Ray as part-time school nurse. Six, thank you. Um, last item, I believe, is 7.2.7, um, Eight Corners Classroom Teacher. This is a one-year position. Ashley Cadlick is, Cadlick is uh, nominated to fill this one-year position that's created by a leave of absence of a current teacher. Ms. Cadlick is a graduate of, graduate of the University of New England with a degree in elementary education, completed her student teaching, interestingly enough, at Eight Corners School, where she was also a long-term substitute in a kindergarten class. Uh, most recently, she participated, in, which means this summer, she participated in the Kindergarten Jump Start Program eight, uh, at Eight Corners, working with incoming kinder, kindergarten students. Uh, the recommendation is to appoint Ashley Cadlick as a one-year Eight Corners School classroom teacher. Move approval. Second. Okay, all in favor of appointing Ashley Cadlick a one-year um, teacher at Eight Corners School. Six, thank you. I have a question. When will students of these classroom teachers be notified of their placement? Students of these classroom it's teachers? Like the Wentworth classroom, there's three Wentworth classroom teachers in eight corners classroom. Okay. Early next week. So I've been asked. Early next week. Great. Thank you. And we're hearing it right from the source. From the one. Okay. Is that, that's all for appointments? It so is. Moving on to 7.3. Um, this is an item on the agenda that would be uh, available for public comment, and there are some people in our audience. So if anyone has anything they would like to add, um, come up to the podium. I can open public comment. Um, the, would, item is the item is uh, an adjustment to the Scarborough Athletics and Activities fees. So open public comment. If anyone is interested. <laughs> Still waiting. <laughs> okay, I see no one approaching the podium. So, <laughs> closing public comment. Would you like me to give a yes, please. an intro? Um, what the board has in front of them and, and basically is available um, with um, Mrs. Johnston up at the, the, the desk here is uh, some revenue histories that have been provided by uh, Kate Bolton, who is our um, business manager, uh, going back a number of years. I think uh, it goes back as far as 03 in some instances. Um, as well, there have been some specifics provided related to school athletics, um, which include the sport, um, the number of participants, fees paid, and total revenues that have been generated um, from each of those uh, sports. Um, and that includes both the middle and the high school. On uh, the proposal that is created, uh, that has been created, uh, the revenue shortfall um, ends up being a net amount uh, to be projected at approximately $30,500. The recommendation then is to um, make increases um, that are then able to offset the projected net shortfall, specifically to increase high school sports um, to $125, and that's from $100, to increase middle school sports to $100, and that is from $75, to increase high school clubs to $55, and that is from $50, to increase middle school clubs to $30, that's from $25, to increase Wentworth um, clubs to $30, and that is um, from $25 to $30, and to increase parking fees to $30 per semester, which are currently at $25 uh, per semester. Um, there are at least, I think, two aspects uh, to uh, be considered when entertaining this recommendation. One is fiscal, the other one is, um, if you will, policy or philosophical. Uh, this proposal um, uh, basically addresses only the reconciliation that's needed to avert another um, anticipated budget shortfall. Um, and what Kate has done, and, and Mike has worked, clo Mike Legage has worked closely with Kate in looking at these numbers, looking at the trends, and attempting to reconcile um, uh, 
uh, this uh, what appears to be a, a persistent shortfall. And I think that I would liken it to the um, other uh, couple of persistent shortfalls that we've seen in the budget. And I think the best uh, one known to the board is, is school nutrition, for example. I also think it's important to note that this is not related to the budget reductions that were made in athletics and activities um, in the last, in the very last iteration that was approved um, by the community. Um, and I would say, uh, to get your discussion started, that um, I would recommend approval of the proposal that has been um, prepared for you. Do we have a motion? To get the... I'll, I'll move approval. Second. Okay, um, just before we start discussion, I know this is um, a cog in a much bigger wheel, so I would I want to hear what everyone has to say because it's the first time we've discussed it, but if it gets way off track, I might cut you off, but just don't take it personal. Well. <laughs> but I just think it's important we stay on this subject specifically. Okay. Good. Therefore, go. I, I can go first. Um, I, as uh, the board members know and Dr. Angelo knows, I, I, I posed a series of questions earlier to him in writing and uh, I'll ask them again here. I, I did get some of the answers mm -hmm. from Kate, and I do appreciate that. Um, some of them, I think, still need a little bit more explanation. Uh, the first question I had was uh, approximately how many students, either number of percentage, participate and pay the activity and athletic fees? And I will um, acknowledge the fact that Kate's spreadsheet did spell out specifically the athletic portion of that and right. the parking as well, and that was very much appreciated, but the activity section was missing, or right. la just wasn't available at the time. Right, and, and uh, she, was not, uh, she was not able, uh, because she had other commitments, to um, answer your question. That specific question, I think, Chris, just to give you a sense of it, um, I think that if, um, if there were no adjustments made to activity fees, Quite honestly, the overall impact would be fairly insignificant. So that gives you a, and that was sort of a, through a discussion I had with with Kate. Um, so that gives you a sense that in fact um, there's um, there are many activities that don't require a fee, mm -hmm. um, and there are um, some that do that are very small numbers of kids. Um, there are some that carry credit so that they don't they carry academic credit so they don't. Um, require a fee, and so um, the, I think the way that that um, I checked my understanding with her was to say, so it's, it's a relatively small percentage. Basically, the big enchilada is the athletic fees that are, that are paid, um, and, and tailing by comparison are, are those that relate to activities. Okay. And I know that's not specific, but it gives you a, at least a, a relative sense of it. Yeah, my, my concern is that it's, it's equitable across the board, and, and I want to make sure we don't have a small number of students impacted adversely and a larger number of people having no impact at all. If we're going to make this decision, I think it's yep. important to know how many kids we're going to impact here. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Kristen if she wants. If she's yeah, um, just kind of coming from sort of like the other side of not focusing on like the budget but being the person, part of the family that's paying these fees, for, I know at least for my family, it's me and my little brother in the high school, both of us being three sport athletes, this increase in fees adds an extra $150 onto like my family's budget and I feel like it's almost, that kind of raising these fees, it seems to punish the students who are involved in athletics and activities, which is something that we try so hard to encourage everybody to do. I can continue, I, I actually have, I have six questions which you all know, so I'll, I'll go through rather quickly, I hope. Okay. Um, how much the increase is being asked for, that was very clear in the spreadsheet as well. Um, I guess the follow-up question to that would be, um, how was the each amount determined at each level? What, what determined uh, a, um, an increase um, of $25, let's say, at the high school level, but only $5 at the activity level? Mm -hmm. I, uh, Mr. Legage may have been more involved in, in that, those specifics. I'd be happy to, to, to give you my thoughts on it, but um, Mike, can you? give a sense as to what that discussion was? Uh, yep. The, uh, <coughs> I think 
like Dr. Entwistle said, the uh, club activities, it's a fairly insignificant amount. Most clubs don't pay a fee at this point because they're either waived by the board um, or they receive some type of academic credit now. Um, and I think that the, so the shortfall over the years, um, if you look at that chart, has been from um, athletics. Most, um, I will say, it is not from non-collectibles. Um, I think we had um, a total of about 16,000 in athletics that was uncollected. Um, a portion of that, and Kate would have to tell me that, but a portion of that would be students that were either on free and reduced lunch or, um, or got waived somehow um, due to financial reasons. Um, I would say probably a large portion of that was, was due to that. Uh, most kids um, in athletics do pay their fee. Um, it's very seldom that they don't, so I would, I would guess that a larger percent came from that. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's financially based, frankly, to answer that question. Okay. Um, we, however you want to do it, if you want to... Well, Jane had a question, so if you want to keep going, or I could... You want to well, piggyback on that particular question, or if you want me to keep going? Um, just keep going. Okay. 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 Go ahead. Um, uh, will there be any actions to try and increase student participation in activities in athletics so that this burden is spread um, amongst a greater population of students? Are we going to do anything to, um, you know, uh, increase clubs or activities or try and garner more participation from the student body? I don't, I don't know what percentage of population we have in it's participation very, right now. It's a, very, it's a very healthy participation right. level now, Chris. and. Um, I don't think that we, I mean, I, I, think, I think at the high school and at the middle school they encourage kids to be involved and they will continue to do that um, as they always have. I, I don't think that we would make a special effort to try to include kids um, purely to generate the revenue to defray, to, you know, to defray the overall um, expense for, um, or, you know, I think you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So the answer is no, no, I don't think we would make any special effort any more than what we already do to, to include kids and we do have a very healthy um, participation level if you look at us versus other schools. Interestingly enough in the greater Portland area there's healthy participation in many many of the schools. As, is that, would you agree with that? Yeah we just happened to look at those numbers for <laughs> high school <laughs> athletics. We, we um, have a little over 300 students participate each season. Um, so a little over 900 students of the 1,100 students in school. And I would say under 100 of those students are crossover kids. Um, so we have, we're very fortunate that our, our kids are involved in a lot of things after school. I would say clubs, um, there are some clubs that are traditionally small clubs, it's just by their very nature, um, but we have some larger ones too. We have nearly, I think, 100 students involved in Key Club and things of that nature, but um, so I'd say our club programs are uh, probably see around, around those same numbers, six to 800 kids, um, and I think uh, Ms. Hathorn or Mr. Curry, I might speak to middle school, but I would say that the percentage is probably equivalent to that of students involved in after school activities. Okay. Is your question, um, Donna, directly related to that question, or should we just let Chris go through his list? And, okay. okay. Carry on, Chris. <laughs> Thanks. Um, what are the areas of revenue generation have been explored and to what extent? Well, I think that we've begun some discussions about a lot of different things, um, and I think that we need to continue to do that. I think we need to put together a little team of folks, um, and we have some interest because of our recent cuts. Um, we have some parent interest in wanting to 
um, help out with that process. And I think that we should look at a lot of options. I think one of the options, one of the things that we should look at is um, you know, how how the how what athletics is paying for the types of things that are in our budget and the types of things that are not in our budget, <laughs> frankly. So um, I think that has there been an attempt to get a sponsor, for example? No, um, unless you look at what the boosters do. Now we know that collectively our athletic boosters and we have a we do have one booster group on the club side for band. Um, they collectively raise somewhere between three and five hundred thousand dollars for our programs. It's significant, um, as, as you know. Um, our boosters are funding essential components of our programs. Um, I think we we need to take a look at those things in our budget that we pay out to the municipal side of things as well. I think that's uh, a, a re something to have a reasonable discussion about. Um, but are we looking to get a major sponsor to cover programs? We haven't looked at that, uh, partially because I, I feel that um, we need to first align ourselves with covering the essential components of program of the things that we offer. We have to make a decision whether we're going to do that or not do that. And because you, we can't run a department based on if we get fundraising one year and we don't the next year and we get a sponsor this year but we don't the next year, I don't think that's fair to the well over a thousand students that we serve in our programs after school. Um, so by, is it worthy of discussion? Of course it is. Anything's worthy for discussion. And we, we want to welcome that. And we have some, certainly some, we've had some interest. I know Ms. Chiazzo has been very helpful with a small committee that we've put together to start those discussions. Um, and I think that we have some recent um, interest in people wanting to join that those discussions too, given um, the recent cuts, so I think anything is worthy of discussion, and that certainly is is one thing. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, the last question I have is: um, Was the reduced revenue that resulted from the middle school changes considered? And if so, how much is revenue expected to be reduced by these actions? And again, in fairness, that was stated on Kate's. Uh, Excel sheet, so that was very clear, but if you wanted to speak to that. Um, I, I'm not really sure I understand. The, it, it did, did the uh, projections include the adjustments that have been made at the middle school? Yes. So that's why I said um, specifically it's, um, it's the net amount that's, uh, that, that is proposed in yeah. terms of the shortfall. The intent of the question was to say with a reduction in program, we would lose those those student ac activity fees because there's no longer a program for them to pay for. So if we're are we offsetting those losses by increasing the funds on the high school side or another area? That was the intent of that question. But it, again, Kate's Kate's Excel spreadsheet was very uh, specific, and it looks like the difference was um, about eleven thousand eleven hundred uh, eleven thousand one hundred dollars was the expected difference. So that's about a third of what you're asking for, though, in essence, right? It, or that's it's one third of $30,000 increase that we're asking for, right? Is that a fair assessment? Um, it is. I just, okay. um, it, that's, it, it, I think our understandings are not the same, though. Um, my question to Kate was, given the change at the middle school and given the revenue that that would <laughs> generate, have we netted out that impact? Because that it, it generates revenue, but it but it also requires expense, mm -hmm. and so so the the answer is that she has netted out um, the contribution that would come at the same time. I believe she's also reduced the expense of it. But my understanding was that that additional savings that was netted out would go towards the creation of the intramural program. So that wouldn't be something that we would actually realize 
as a an actual savings that would be reinvested in programs for that was those students. That right. was the intent. Right. So we've lost that. And again, I just want to make sure I understand it. We've lost that revenue stream on the fee side. What we've saved on the expense side in terms of stipends and costs, we're going to reinvest that into an intramural program. To the extent that, to the extent that okay. that exists. Okay. As you, you know, essentially what we're talking about is sort of a, a recurring sh shortfall. So um, that that, but that is correct. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. I, I do have just one question to follow up on that. Um, do we anticipate kids in the middle school who are participating in these um, intramural teams to pay an activity fee that would be commensurate to playing on a seventh grade sports team? Are you asking me that yeah, question? Yeah, anyone, anyone. <laughs> I would anyone say, who knows? I would say no. No. Intramurals are not usually fee-based, is that correct? I know. Right. In fact, that is the, that's one of the Beauties. It's also very consistent with the middle school philosophy, um, which really encourages all students to get involved in a team and to play. Um, and uh, so, uh, so the answer would be, it would not be generating any revenue, so it would not cost. Um, it would it would not cost kids to play. Good. Thank you. Um, I know everyone down here had questions too. So questions. whoever wants to go first, Donna, <coughs> you want to go ahead. I just have a comment, so I don't have a question. I think in looking at the, the proposal, I think I want to remind everybody, including the parents or the students who is going to be impacted by this you know, proposal, um, I think um, this is a, compared to what we actually spend as a district for this activity. Probably these activity fees are a very small portion of uh, the, you know, the spending. So, by that's why I don't see by you know go back to Chris the question earlier. Going encourage more people actually is definitely going to cost us more money instead of uh, overall. And so I think gradually, you know, we do have a shortfall here and needs to be. Um, f filled and needs to be corrected, and more compared to the percentage-wise, it's not very much. I think these small increases should have very less impact than we hold back several years and give a big increase. So, and I understand some families. You know, everybody going to say, you know, what is how much going to impact us, but consider the benefit you are getting by participating in these programs, and it's enormous. And also on the back of taxpayers, the raw, the rest of the cost. So I think everybody is actually getting a very good deal. I have two kids, and they participate. And I think from the activity phase, you know, everything you do, you won't get any value like that anywhere. So I just want to make that point. Thank you. Thank you. Donna? <coughs> so, um, so Basically, as I see it, we have a thousand students between the middle and high school participating in these events. Is that right, Mike? Is that what I heard you say? It's probably a little over. Okay, a little over a thousand students participating. Um, we've had a shortfall for two, three years. It's been it's been going Longer? up and down, but what's projected for the, the the current year that we're about to enter is the thirty thousand. It's been higher than that. It's been lower than that. And what we're asking now is for a five dollar to maybe fifty dollar over the course of the year for a student to add to a particular cost in order to participate in, say, two sports. Correct. Have I got that right? Correct. Seems like the value is pretty high in terms of what we already in order to support these sports. So um, I, I'm in favor of, of this. Kelly, um, Kelly, can I respond to that? Okay. Jackie's waiting, but okay. okay. Go, well, go, go ahead, ahead, Jackie, if you want to. I, you, I, you have a follow-up to then? I do, to, to Donna's point. I, I think it's very important for us to realize that on the surface, the initial fee increase is very minor, but to Kristen's point, um, the overall impact to these students is, is fairly significant because in addition to what we're paying 
what they're paying for fees, they're also paying booster fees as well. So the cost of participation is escalating. It is. So yes. I would agree that on the surface a $5 increase doesn't seem like a lot of money, but when you couple that with the booster cost, with the additional fees, parking fees at, you know, at the high school level, let me pay in three or four different fees, I do think it's significant. So I, I want to make sure we put it into perspective before we, before we make a quick decision of saying, you know, look, it's a fairly insignificant increase on the surface, mm -hmm. but it does, it does matter. It does make a difference, I think. So. Well, and hopefully our, our students are, you know, looking for opportunities to do little side jobs uh, around their neighborhood or babysitting or mowing the lawn, doing some shoveling. I mean, I just, I think it, in, when you take a look at the amount of money we're already putting into all these um, sports and activities, it, it still feels like it, it's not that that big. Uh, I just think that the value is enormous for the kids to participate. But I mean, and I know it's a little bit more. But on the other hand, you know, our our, our families expect this. They they want to have all these opportunities for their kids. I would just add one more thing. It's not just the activity fees and the booster fees. The cost of equipment is no small thing either. Right. I mean, a boys lacrosse can be $300. I know hockey is very expensive, so that's another cost for parents. Do you have one clarification? Clarification on the, if you play three sports for the year, has the fee gone up? Has, is, has the cap, guess. if you are, is there a, the family cap gone up or it's for an individual? I didn't see I that. don't know what the proposal, the proposal doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't speak, speak to that. It doesn't speak to that, so. Cap, so. Okay. I would guess that the proposal would not include a cap. Okay. Um, Jackie, did you want to? What it says here, that, let me say that, it says here, max, fair, max fee in one school year equals $300. That was, that was, old, the, old, that's the, that was the old, that was in the old fee, so I'm not sure if that still applies. Anyway, I have a couple of comments first. One is that I don't think there's any way we should be charging a fee for children at the Wentworth School to participate, and I've, I don't believe in fees to begin with, but it's realistic that we've had a shortfall and, and somehow it has to be covered. That's number one. It appears that when we had a very low fee, which I, I don't recall what we started out with, like $12 a semester or something, that from 2003 to 2009, 2008, excuse me, there was a surplus. And starting in 2009, that's when we must have gone to the higher fee, there was a $22,000 shortfall. And after that, the shortfalls have been up and down, up and down, up and down. The, we have never to my knowledge, had a reason for the number, the budget number, that we say we're going to raise money for or charge fees to raise money for. We've simply said that when we've developed the budget that we need another $200,000, so we're going to charge fees. And that's from the very beginning, by the way. It's not recent. It is from the very beginning. So that was my first criticism in the beginning, and it is a criticism that I have now. Secondly, we have never designated as a board, as a finance committee, as a school district, how we are going to cover the shortfall when we have students who cannot afford the participation fee. So it comes up that it looks like the students and their families are not stepping up to the plate and paying the fee. And if they can't afford to pay to participate, we've said that they don't, that we don't wish to deprive any student of participation because they can't afford it. I've coached. I coached for a lot of years, long before participation fees. 
And I, along with many other coaches, and though there are people here who have coached as well know, how many times a coach has purchased socks, sneakers, uh, warm-ups for a student who just couldn't afford it. That's the usual, folks. Our teachers and coaches are doing that on a regular basis. <coughs> Parents are doing it not necessarily for their child, but for the child who lives next door who can't afford it. I know this for a fact. We all know this. So now we're talking about increasing the fees. Without a plan at all on how we're going to cover any shortfall if this doesn't work. So I cannot, uh, I cannot in good conscience vote for an increase in fees unless I know what the plan is, folks. And I take as much responsibility of that for that as anybody in the room. So that's where I stand. Um, Jody? I just have a few points. Um, I know we hate to continue to go back to the boosters and, and figure out ways to help them offset costs, but I'm wondering if part of the unpaid fees could be picked up by the boosters of those sports. Are there creative ways that we can look at this without having to ask the student athletes to pay more? They're paying fees for all of these you know, booster fees, their uniforms, whatever, and we're now asking them for one more thing. So I'm just wondering if there are a variety of, of creative ways to raise the funds without having to up the fees. Could we increase admission prices to football games, to basketball games? Those are grandparents who are coming to watch their kids, their grandkids play, or aunts and uncles that are coming to play. That would be happy to pay six dollars versus five dollars, or whatever it may be. That's their only donation over the course of the year. The kids aren't actually feeling that pain. So that's one idea. Sponsorships of teams. I think some way getting the community businesses involved. Um, would be helpful. I get the, the risky part of, okay, they participate, they sponsor this year, but then don't sponsor next year. That becomes a risk. But I just feel like there are, there are other revenue streams to look at before we make a quick decision to say, okay, we're increasing the fees. It's the quickest, easiest way. I think there are more creative ways to go about it. I agree with that, and I was actually thinking the same thing about concessions, you know, that would be another way to raise some money. I'm not saying we could cover the entire shortfall with it, but I, I'm so hesitant to increase the burden on families because I know that there are families who just won't ask for help, and there are students who will miss out, mm -hmm. who won't participate in activities or athletics because their parents won't fill out the forms, because they're too embarrassed to ask for the form. And I know that, you know, you shouldn't put pride ahead of your kid participating, but I know there are families who will just say, sorry, we're not going to do it. And I absolutely believe that a well-rounded education includes participation in athletics and activities, and this is just disenfranchising those kids. And those parents, by the way, are also already paying taxes, and they're paying for the um, sneakers, and they're paying for the cleats, and they're paying for the shin pads, and they're paying for everything else. So they're not getting a free ride on the back of anyone for this. And already these activity fees are so high. I think we already are, have lost students that are unable to participate. So I have a very, very hard time um, stomaching the idea of just raising it um, because we don't know what else to do right now. I mean, there's... I don't know, I don't know how to cover it. I don't know what the answer is, but I, I just don't feel like this is... I, I can't support this, Donna. So can we um, amend this proposal to include the intent to create a subcommittee to look at this, or are we looking at uh, tabling this topic once again? What's the... And the, and the finance committee to put an advisory team. 
There is a way to do that, Donna. So hang on. <laughs> Okay, I, I have more comments. I think just like uh, George said, this is a uh, fiscal issue, also a philosophical issue. I think um, for from my personal view, I think um, we need to have a big picture. You know, the what approved by the taxpayer every year is the whole budget, and how we spend it and allocate it is going to affect everybody too. So if we look at one single area and say, you know what, we put in less, more money in there and somewhere else, that money has to come from. And I know, you know, agree with, you know, um, Jody says we need to have creative ways to find ways to raise more revenues. But I think raising revenue is very important. Um, I think everybody seems like think, you know, yeah, doing sports is, uh, you know, kids should, it's good for the kids, so they should be entitled to them. And I actually don't agree with that view. I think, you know, there are things in life that's more expensive than others. Not everybody growing up in Maine says, you know, we spend the money, go skiing, because I have met a lot of men who have never afforded to go ski. And there are some sports that's very expensive, like hockey or, or you know, lacrosse, which requires expensive equipment. If parents choose to let the kids participate in that uh, those sports, and they should step up unless they are in a you know, free lunch in a poverty level, and that brings, we, you know, as a, we can understand. But yes, you do have to make choices in life no matter what you do, you know, with, with the financial resources. So I really think, you know, raising um, the revenue from to help our school, overall school district and also, you know, the, the net people make more better choices, you know, careful choices, what kind of sports you take on. That is something I think, you know, it's parents really have to consider and the kids have to know it's we nobody entitled to go to golf every weekend because they are, you know, because, well, you know what, that's not how life works, so. I feel like it's not almost like an entitlement issue. It's the fact that as students and like young adults developing, we need to learn and experience things. And I feel like if that kind of denies some students who maybe like there's a seventh grade kid, like I was in seventh grade, who's like, hey, I'm going to try and play field hockey. And I really developed a total love for the sport, and it's like one of my favorite things to do now. But a student who is worried about paying for it, getting the forms, filling everything out, might not decide to try that and might not develop a total love for something they never would have expected. And I think the um, like the like benefits that they get from playing sport, being on a team, making friends is so much more than the kind of like money that they would have to spend and the money they can not afford for it. Jody? And we, we keep saying sports, but I don't think um, it comes down to just sports. It's it's activities in general. And I think parents know going in that they do need to sort of step up. And we need to make sure that they're supporting their students all the way through the process and making sure that they pay for what they need to pay for. But we don't need to add extra burden onto that um, from our side. Okay. As I, as I said, you know, if money doesn't come from here, it has to come from other places. And you know, we we already know our uh, um, academic curriculum is really short on funding over in our know, district. So that's something I, we really have to keep on the back of our head. Thank you. Okay. Well, you all know how I like to have the last word, so I'll, this will be my last comment for me, at least. Anyway, um, I, I think it's pretty clear we've got a. It, this is really a philosophical debate that we've been coming to uh, a point at for a while as a board. Um, I, I think, um, to me, the core issue, and not to get off track with the fee issue, but it's a question of how much do we support extracurricular activities and how much we don't as a community, not as a board, not as a district, but as a community. 
And there does have to be, to, there is, it's a pie. There's only so many slices and so many ways to slice it and dice it. For this particular instance, I do feel that the athletics are taking a disproportionate amount of the burden. And I understand why I, I, the gap needs to be filled somehow, but I really can't support this because I do think we need to be more creative and we need to look at other opportunities first that don't directly impact students and families this way. I know there's things that we can do to improve on. So I would like to see at least for this year and maybe the next year, we treat this like we treat all of the other shortfalls in the accounts and we cover it with the understanding that we need to address this head on as a board. We need to come up collectively with a, a, a philosophy and move forward with that. So I, I can't support this in the way it's, it's sit now. I think it is, I, I understand the merits. I know a lot of work went into it and I, I don't fault anybody behind it. Um, all the best of intentions are there. I just think we have other options we should explore first. May I have to say something before you call the phone? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think, uh, I'm not sure how many times I've said this before, but I do actually agree with Mr. Chiazzo. Um, on, you were doing that? <laughs> I was just trying to lighten the mood here, but um, I, I, as I said when I opened up, th th there's really two aspects to this. Um, I, we're coming at this from the fiscal side, and I think that this is an appropriate recommendation and it's an appropriate action to take, and I'll tell you why. It's because we basically here in Scarborough um, are um, uh, living the athletic slash activity life um, that we can't really afford, um, and that's evident by way of the dependence that we have on boosters and, um, and, in, and uh, evidence by way of the shortfall. I think that um, while we may believe that there are many creative ways to generate other money, um, uh, having been, uh, ha ha this not being my first prom in terms of athletic issues, I can tell you that it's quite difficult to come up with ideas that don't begin to really move in a way of, for example, sponsorship and sponsorship slash ownership. And in some ways, that's essentially um, the dilemma that we fall into with the boosters. And the question is, how much further do we want to extend that? I will continue to say that we are inadequately funded academically, and that is my biggest worry Absolutely. here. Absolutely. And in fact, um, so, so now moving to the philosophical side and the policy side, y yes, this is a very unpopular move. I do think that this is an appropriate action to take, but as well, I do understand why the board is hesitant. Um, Chris, you said it perfectly, and I think I, I think I, um, we've we've had conversation in finance committee. This is this is a big nut to crack, and it's and we got to we got to take it on because um, if given the choice, um, as superintendent, given the landscape and the amount of money that's in that landscape, um, I would continue to advocate that the property line move further and further over into. Act, act, athletics and activities so that I can more adequately fu uh, fund our academics. And so we've got to figure out what is the solution to this. And I think that you and Mike and a few other people and apparently some new interests are willing to jump in. So as far as voting this thing, well, you'll vote it in whatever way you do, but if it's unsuccessful tonight, I, I hope that it's the impetus and the catalyst to commit to to, to taking it on, and boy, it's not going to be easy. So do we, do we have to vote on this before yep. we add any kind of amendment? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? To, no. I want to move to. Oh, yeah, we already have the motion. Okay, so. motion. And it's seconded. Yeah. Now we just a vote. All in favor of increasing um, or adjusting the athletics and activities fees? As proposed. As proposed. Two, and opposed? Four. Okay, so I guess we need that committee. Thank you. And we'd be, I'd be happy to take that up in finance because I think that's the place to start for sure. I, I think, and, and it's, been, it's, it's been revving up in yep. finance anyway, so yep. I yep. think that's good. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to committee reports. Jackie? Yes, we will have, uh, as I've said at the last meeting, it appears as though uh, we will have an agreement shortly with the uh, support staff, and we are meeting tomorrow in negotiations with the uh, uh, bus drivers, and we're hoping that we will have that finished off uh, tomorrow. That is our aim. And then on the 6th of September, we will be back at the table uh, in arbitration over the uh, custodial cafeteria worker contract. Thank you. Anything for long range planning? No, we haven't been since June. Thank you. Thank you. Donna? Nothing additional. Okay. Jody, you haven't met with your business no. crew? Chris? Um, no finance meetings since the last meeting. However, we do have one scheduled for the 27th. And obvious, as always, any board members welcome to attend. I think we'll be doing a, Jordan, if I'm not mistaken, a budget recap or at least a, a looking at year end. And, and we have to look at year end too. I'll present the year end to the board like I typically do, but looking at the uh, last budget cycle as well. What time is that meeting? Uh, it is scheduled for currently for 10 a.m. on Wednesday, uh, August 27th. Okay, um, and policy also has not met since our last meeting. Um, Jackie? I just, I just uh, want to make a, a note. I think if you add up all of those fees, the potential, if everybody had paid the fee, we would have been over the budgeted amount. And being under by $12,000, uh, I don't think it's huge. Thank you. I just want to make one more comment, too. Um, unfortunately, he just left, but we did have um, a Boy Scout in our audience tonight who is um, here for a merit badge. She interviewed me on Monday um, um, nice. as part of that. So, JT DeGrini, we know you were here and appreciate it. <laughs> it's documented. It is. Enter him into the minutes. <laughs> yes. Great. Okay, I would entertain a motion for adjournment, unless anyone has anything else. Move, Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Six plus one. Thank you. And you have something for me to sign?